It knows your, who you are. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's a beautiful fall day, and the sun is shining. So it's such a privilege to be here in the atrium of the Learning and Environmental Sciences building here at the Institute on the Environment. And I think the sun helps us remember actually what is, how extraordinary it is that we can all gather together to talk about the important ideas that we're going to discuss today. My name is Jessica Hellman. I'm the director of the Institute on the Environment, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all. Uh, I hope you'll actually come back and join us again November 11th for our second in this series of Second Mondays. So we at the Institute, uh, we do this on behalf of the university as a whole. Our mission, our objective, we say we're here to help build a future where people and planet prosper together. And we think there are three essential ingredients to making that happen, or it is our job to bring, help to bring those three essential ingredients to life. One, we say novel ideas, ways of thinking about the world and putting ideas into practice that really move the needle on sustainability. Two, building the leaders, activated leaders, people who are capable of putting those ideas into practice. And third, telling world-class stories about both those ideas and people to really make a difference. And this afternoon, we're here to advance each one of those things today. Fortunately, we have a spectacular leader of an incredibly exciting panel this afternoon, and now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Jennifer Schmidt, who will lead us in this conversation today on food and food waste. Jennifer is a senior scientist and a program lead here at the Institute on the Environment. She's also, more importantly, an international expert on sustainable supply chains, particularly in the agricultural sector. Jennifer holds a PhD in conservation biology, which she earned from this esteemed institution here at the University of Minnesota. She also has master's and bachelor's degrees in applied economics, biology and international relations. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jennifer Schmidt. I was told I didn't have to turn it on. Okay. Sorry for the technical difficulties. One more announcement real quick. Um, this is a big week for food systems thinking. The Food Ag Ideas Week is wrapping up tomorrow. It's been from the end of last week through the weekend through tomorrow. And thanks to the generosity of Grow North, you all received a coupon code, code in your email um, if you did register um, so that you can attend for free their talk on food waste tomorrow. It's at 1 p.m. at the Walker Art Center. So. Um, I encourage you to go, and if you didn't receive that code or don't know about it, you can talk to the lovely ladies in the back. I'd like to open this meeting by acknowledging that we are in Dakota Oyote, the ancestral land of the Ochiti, Shakoween, and sacred land of the Dep Dakota people. This is unceded land of the Dakota. Taking a moment to acknowledge the land that we're on helps us recognize the harms and mistakes of the past and the benefits that accrued to settlers, including my own ancestors. I grew up in the mountains of Colorado, largely ignorant about the history of Native people, though it was literally all around me. In my years of hiking around those mountains, I regularly passed trees bent at various angles, many of which I now know were modified by the Ute. They did this for many reasons, including to point towards Pikes Peak, a site of spiritual significance. I now raise my children here on the sacred land of the D Dakota people. I am working to understand and share the history and lasting impact of colonization, preventing the last, <laughs> fixing the lasting impact of colonization, forgive me, and truly see the land upon which we call home and understand the truth underneath this land. Recognizing the truth of colonization is important to healing and reconciliation and is needed for respectful partnership with indigenous people. I and E is at the beginning of land acknowledging, as am I. This is ongoing work. With every conversation, we will continue to learn. If you would like to learn with me and with I and E, I urge you to join our monthly DEI meetings here at the Institute on the Environment. 
and you can feel free to find me or again the people at the back to find out more at the end of this event. So now I'm going to move on to our panel where we will discuss food waste. As most of you likely know, a third to 40% of all food globally and in the United States goes to waste. Though there is waste along the entire supply chain, from farm field to garbage can, we are going to focus on the largest source of waste, the end consumer. It is here in our schools and homes where we also face the issue of hunger, and these dual problems perhaps are interlinked. I have an excellent panel here with me to talk about these issues. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves and to share with us a little bit about who they are and how they have come about to work on the issue of food waste. Should we just go down the line? How about now? There. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. I'm Tracy Deutsch. I'm an associate professor in the history department. Uh, I work in historical and using the tools of gender studies to understand the histories of food and particularly uh, women's work around food. So my first research project was about the emergence of supermarkets and the reasons why we have mass retelling around food and the ways that a rhetoric of women's satisfaction played into that. I'm working now on a project about mid-century uh, domestic labor and gourmet cooking. Uh, but I also, on top of that, do just a lot of public engagement and interdisciplinary work around food and critical food studies. And I was just delighted to be brought into the conversation on food waste by Jennifer a while ago. And I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Hello. <laughs> I shocked myself, sorry. Um, I'm Hikaru Peterson. I'm a professor in applied economics. And um, one of the things that I always talk, actually talk about is, is how I got into food waste. And I'm really glad to see Barrett. Uh, I just saw you. Oh, you're disappearing. Hi. So I saw Barrett uh, in December of 2015, which was the first uh, winter since we moved to um, Minnesota. And uh, there was a, a sustainable food system coll colloquium that was put together by um, the Office of Vice President for Research. And um, it was, it was a, a really uh, serendipitous to, to be uh, there. And one of the breakout topics uh, we were allowed to choose a topic was food waste. And I thought, what an oxymoron. <laughs> you know, food that we value is, is being wasted. So uh, that's where I met uh, Barrett. And, um, uh, I, and that's where my journey really with the food waste really started. So um, just, it's actually amazing that the uh, attention of food waste has really uh, developed so rapidly over the last few years. So back in 2015, it was still relevant to talk about what, how do you define food waste and how do you measure food waste? So that's where uh, my journey started uh, with my colleagues. And then... Um, from then on, we really wanted to have some sort of a baseline for uh, the state of Minnesota, and that's where um, Jennifer and I got involved. We also wanted to know what are some of the efforts that were going on in terms of uh, food waste reduction and uh, food waste um, uh, just uh, recovery and, and, and reuse. And, um, and then since then, I've had opportunities to work with Hennepin County and also with Ramsey County, looking at some of the household waste behavior. And it's really recent that uh, Tracy joined the conversation, and it's, I'm still really learning the intersection between um, uh, really humanities and, and, um, and just, yeah, it's, it's just really an exciting journey, so thank you. Um, is this up? Yeah, okay. all right. Hi, uh, my name is Will Bergstrom. I am the president of the Food Recovery Network here at the University of Minnesota. Um, it is a national chapter organization, but we have our own chapter here at the U. Um, Food Recovery Network started in 2011, I think, from the University of Maryland. It was just a group of students, and they were thinking, hey, we're seeing a lot of food on our campus being wasted. We want to find a way to make sure it's being reused and actually being ate, because that's what the big issue with food waste is. It's going to waste. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but yeah, so the University of Minnesota chapter started, I believe, in 2014 by Becca Lighton, who runs now the Nutritious You Food Pantry. Um, and since then, we've been just trying to continue to um, recover from on-campus restaurants, usually, and um, 
dining halls at the end of the year and stadiums uh, whenever football games happen. Um, and it's mostly an issue because, um, I mean, food waste wherever is an issue, but on campus we also have issues of hunger. Um, through the Nutritious You Food Pantry, a poll was done and Becca Lighton was doing this research and she found 17% of students who went to the pantry um, were worried they were going to run out of food at some point and 11% actually were facing shortages at some point. So not only is it an issue throughout the world, but even on campus where we think we have access to plenty of uh, resources of housing and food it is an issue. So Will, when you recover that food, what do you do with it? Um, so most of all the food we recover does not actually go back to the students. It goes to um, a Catholic charity called Loaves and Fishes, and they usually redistribute it throughout the Twin Cities. They have a large distribution center um, right off Casota, and so we can bring hundreds of pounds of food for them to them, and they are able to redistribute it all throughout the Twin Cities, which makes our job a lot easier. So food waste is interesting in that there are an upside down food pyramid, imagine that, um, where you look at what you should do with food. Either prevent waste, that's the top level, right? That's preferred. Second, go, go to people. Then um, animals, food waste can go to hogs, for instance. Um, energy, compost, and then last, last is landfill. So I'm curious where in that pyramid you guys have kind of focused either your research or some of your experiences in that food waste hierarchy, they call it. <laughs> so so I, I guess it's just easy to, to tag on to, to Will's thing. So what, one of the things that Jennifer has asked um, uh, me to help with uh, recently is to really look at the National uh, Food Recovery Network uh, data to really understand um, where the, uh, how, how the, the food recovery efforts are across different chapters and if there's a way of uh, characterizing you know, uh, institutional characteristics that would um, promote more effective, uh, more efficient way of, of recovering food. So I guess that's the first tier of, of, the, of the pyramid. Um, one of the works that I mentioned with um, Ramsey County is really looking at the household waste and we were trying to see if uh, the households can respond differently to the amount of food waste that they generate and also in terms of the quality of food waste that they generate in a, in a sense that it's more easily uh, reused by, by the industry, whether it's for composting or for energy use. Um, in, in response to knowing where or how the food waste was going to be uh, used. And, uh, um, and so that's also, it kind of ties across the, the pyramid that you were, you were talking about. Um, and I'm going to hand it over. Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing. Um, I don't know where to hold this. Uh, so I also look at the history of household food use and food waste, and that cuts across that pyramid, I think. Um, I look particularly both at the ways that people have tried themselves to conserve food and also the larger public anxiety about food waste and how that was targeted at certain households. Tell us more about this public anxiety. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so one thing I'm really struck by as a historian is how old this concern about food waste is. So I literally, the other night, did two minutes of research on historic newspapers and I just typed in food waste and I got, and these were on historic newspapers going back um, probably about 100 years, and I got thousands of hits going back that whole time. So I'm just going to... Just to give you a couple of examples of this, um, there was a 1914 article from the Chicago Tribune that encouraged women to use fuel more sparingly in their stoves called fire, fire waste, food waste, um, and accusing women of um, wanting to send good aromas to their neighbors rather than wanting to conserve fuel. <laughs> um, but it, which sounds crazy to us, right? But, it, but if you think about the messages that we're giving people about how to cook in their houses and how to conserve food, it is often about technique and cooking technique. Um, go, and it goes back even further than that. So one of the oldest uh, household advice manuals in the US was um, 
uh, published in 1832. It has this great title of The Frugal Housewife. Um, and it was written by a really interesting woman, Lydia Maria Child. But it opens with the line, um, the true economy of housekeeping is simply the art of gathering up all the fragments so that nothing be lost. And that's from the 1830s. So I'm just really struck by how, how old this anxiety is. And I contextualize con current concerns around food waste in that longer history of anxiety about women's householding and their skills. Why? Why are we still wasting food then? So if I'm going to put on my economist hat, there's always a good reason why we waste uh, uh, food. Um, what, what simple answer is that it's too costly uh, in, in certain ways. So for example, if you, um, you can evaluate a food that could be eaten, but it could also make you sick, or it could, it could give you a bad aftertaste. I had a bad milk in the house earlier this week. But, um, and so would you take that risk you know, to see if, if you can use it and it's still good or, or not? And a lot of times, you know, it's just the best, best benefit and cost uh, decision that we make on the spur of the moment, and it makes sense to throw it away. That's, that's a very simplistic thing. Well, why are some of the reasons that you've seen food in essence being in excess here at the university that you've been able to recover? Um, just like pretty much everywhere else, we need to make sure that we have enough food for whatever we're trying to provide for. So here on campus with our dining halls, we need to make sure we have enough food for all the students and seeing as it's all you can eat um, or buffet style, we order a lot more food than we need to make sure that that surplus is covered and or uh, that it's just it's met. Um, and often the food that uh, is served at the dining halls, we try to, or the dining halls try to reuse it by cooking it into like a hot dish or something like that the next day. Um, but often it's just none of it, or not all of it can be saved and reused. And um, going back to the pyramid after not being able to be, be reused, we do compost everything from our dining halls. But yeah, that's, if we could reuse it or make sure people are eating it, we would like that a lot more. Or five, ten, so? No, I'll stick to two. Um, I, so I think that it, this came out in Hikaru and Will's answers, right? It's um, waste doesn't usually happen because somebody says, oh, I'm going to go and waste some food in my kitchen today. That is my goal, right? It happens because of the context in which they're living and working and the, the constraints on their choices and their, their goals, right? So somebody's food waste is somebody else's efficient cooking, or getting everybody at the table to eat what you made. Um, I th so I think that part of the thinking about food waste that I'm excited to see happening is sort of people thinking more creatively about what counts as waste and the way that your definition of waste shifts depending on your position and your situation. Um, I also think so that's a kind of abstract an answer. A more concrete answer is I think that the reason that there's food waste is because there's food in the first place. And we are people. And people don't typically eat every piece of every bit of food. So yeah, I think that, it, that the, the desire to avoid food waste speaks to not, in some ways is, speaks to the human condition, which is that we have constraints and we have preferences and, those, and limits, and those shape what we do. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'll just tag on to this. As a historian, what's interesting to me is what the anxiety about food waste tells us about the people asking the question. So we can look at the people who said that women shouldn't waste fuel in 1914 and say, what? That's crazy. But it does tell us something about their concern that there was too much fuel being used, right? And the anxiety that, f partly because fuel cost a lot of money, and they saw it as a reason that people were poor. Similarly, I think we can use the discussion about food waste now to talk about, to, to know and to appreciate how many people want to do something about sustainability and how important it is to so many people to do something about climate change. Right? I think we can see that. 
I don't know that we can look at the anxiety about food waste and automatically know what actually is happening in people's kitchens or how much food is actually being wasted. I think it tells us a lot about the people a lot about the people asking the question, and we have a lot of questions to still ask about the people who are maybe doing the waste. So the interest in food waste is a good sign, sorry for the feedback, um, in terms of sustainability is kind of a household thing now? Is, is that, am I understanding you correctly? I think for a lot of people, I'm not gonna say it. A historian Fair. will never say everyone, but, um, <laughs> But for many people, I do think they feel a lot of pressure around sustainability and environmental issues. And I'll just cite one book if folks haven't read it yet. There's a great new book called Pressure Cooker that was written by three sociologists. And they looked at, across class and race, they did interviews with women about their food work. And across class and race, all these women who were facing very different situations felt inadequate and felt they were being told that they should be doing more around food, particularly both around health and also, also around environmental concerns. So yeah, I think it's broadly felt. You have to wait till we get to q and I'm sorry. I get to hold them a little bit longer. <laughs> Go ahead, Will. Um, just going off that and the feelings of uh, like a, a need to do something, I think we are seeing that a lot more nowadays with media, like kind of spitting a lot of environmental um, concerns towards us, but I think it's still often for the average person is not enough in terms of how much they know about food waste. Um, like this is just a campus example, um, but there's events called Way the Waste where students um, put their food that they have not finished into pretty much dumpsters and then it's weighed and it says like, hey, you 300 kids wasted 3,000 pounds of food today, or maybe not that much, but um, so just the awareness, I think, is something that needs to be scaled up and is an issue that comes with food waste because people just don't realize how much is wasted, and not just from their homes, but um, earlier in the supply chain, most people don't realize that like m most food waste happens before it even reaches their home, and like you throwing out your strawberries isn't the best thing in the world, but at the same time, like 30 percent of those strawberries didn't even make it to the market so the issues of awareness i think is really important when it comes to how do we talk and tackle food waste how does the issue of hunger weave into this discussion on food waste or does it um yeah <laughs> uh, i mean it, it it just goes back to um what we consider good food i i think because um, so much of the food that we waste is early in the supply chain, um, produce left on farms, and um, grocery stores not wanting to sell something because it doesn't look good. And we could give that to people who need it, and we could, you know, have a lot more food for a lot more people, but often food that we think of undesirable is just thrown away, and so we don't really see um, the loop being closed, I guess, mm -hmm. in the areas of hunger and how much food we produce because, what is it, 40% of all food produced isn't aid? Yeah. Wow. I was going to um, touch uh, on, on the work that, that Jennifer and I did with the Hennepin County. And one of the um, challenge was trying to recover uh, of produce from a uh, farmer's market in the, in the season and then try to um, process it in a way so that it was available at food pantries. And, um, you know, bless their heart, the, our Hennepin County uh, colleagues, I mean, they really volunteered, you know, to, to uh, put in the hard work to, to process these lots of squash and, and things. But the, the logistics were really challenging. And um, Jennifer, I'm going to pick on you. You don't eat uh, frozen squash. But I, I ate those frozen zucchinis. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Once it was cooked, it was actually very edible, but all of us are so used to um, uh, 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 frozen, frozen foods that were really easy to process. They, they fall apart, you know, so you can only take out the portion that, that you're interested in using and whatnot. And this one that was amateurly packaged were like in clumps. And so you had to, you had to de de uh, thaw out the entire thing in order to be able to use it and things. And, and uh, so, so, you know, there, I think there are a lot of... Uh, logically thinking, if there's, if there's food being wasted, 
sure, it's, you, know, you can redistribute it to folks who actually need them, but I, I think people forget that there's a lot of logistics that needs to be figured out and sorted out before it can really be a, a viable solution. Yeah. I'm gonna butt in on that for a second too because this frozen zucchini, sorry, this frozen zucchini that they had, first off, don't grow zucchini. We don't wanna eat that much of it. Um, I'm sorry, that was the first learn from that project. But then also was that we ha the, the group had to freeze the zucchini as is. They couldn't turn it into like zucchini soup, okay? Now, technically they could have turned it into zucchini soup and then passed that onto the food shelves, but they couldn't have charged for it, right? So, well, actually they could have charged for it, but they wouldn't have gotten the tax write-off. So there's this huge tax write-off if you donate the food. The farmer gets it, the food bank gets it all the way in to the food shelf. But if the food bank puts any value added into that process, then suddenly that tax write-off that makes or breaks this decision to donate that food in the first place um, is, is out the window and they, they have to take this smaller tax break. And so there's no incentive um, in Minnesota to do that. And this is actually something that's been changed in other states. So there's this layer upon layer of, of reasons of why we do these things. But that was yeah, a particularly informative project. Um, so I'm not gonna ask you like, how do we solve this problem? But Because it, it's so complex. But what do we need to know? What more do we need to know or, or learn about in order to solve this problem um, from your perspective? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, just going back to the incentives of uh, saving food and I guess the awareness of food that was not saved earlier down the line. Um, I think changing, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, consumer mindsets is a really big one and really difficult to do, but um, the reason why farmers don't harvest food or produce they think is ugly is because it's not gonna be sold to the consumer. And so just con changing consumer values and um, finding a way to advocate for um, produce or food in general that is not as desirable, if we can change the mindset of, around it, I think we'd be able to get a lot more um, buy-in and a lot more reason to save that food. So the way, the way I would see it um, is, is a, um, so, so one of the studies that um, my, my grad student and I have done is to try to, to um, group different consumers or individuals on how they relate to food and how they're related to, how it's a, related to their food waste behavior. And one of the things that I think are quite salient that comes out is that there are folks like all of you who are here to hear, you know, to learn more about food waste and do something about it who care. Uh, and there's a whole, you know, a whole segment of the population who really couldn't care about, about how they handle with food. Um, food is just like a sustenance. If they eat enough calories, they can move on with their life. They don't consider themselves all that skilled in the, in the kitchen. And, and so, you know, food is just like something you have to live with, kind of a, of a, of a mentality. And so it, I, I'm sure there's a population that would be actually gain a lot from being awareness. And, and if, they're, if they're more made aware, they would proactively take some actions to do better. But I really do think that there, there's come a point where there's no way to to have everybody buy into doing something about it. And so where I end up with is that even the best intended people uh, who try to sort, like say, organics you know, from, from the waste, and I'm sure a lot of you take those compostable, uh, compostable bags to, to Ramsey County or Hennepin County, you might be participating in the curbside uh, organic recycling. Um, it's really hard to uh, really scrape up all those you know, organics to, to make sure they just have the organics and then the, the other non-organic recyclables into the, into the right things and whatnot. And I just think that the companies, industries that are working on food packaging uh, needs to come up with just completely compostable uh, material so the whole thing can go in the trash. Um, the reason why you know, I, I come to this is that just scratching the surface of the his historical perspective, there is a reason why we have uh, convenient food. That we, there's so, you know, we, we just are so lucky that right now we have this single portion foods and stuff, and it's because our lifestyle has, um, has really uh, called for a need for convenience and, and the industry has responded. And I don't think once you 
have that convenience. You can't tell people to take away that convenience. That's, that's just not practical. And so I feel like now the, the industry who, particularly those that provide the, the packaging, can really take the leadership in, in, in providing the solution. So I guess my first answer is that we need research like Kikaru and Jennifer's. Um, I really think we need to understand more about why people waste food, and that requires talking to them and really doing in-depth studies about what is actually happening rather than what, you know, what amount of food can we weigh coming out of their houses. Um, and, it, and it's only by really imagining the conditions under which people are cooking and serving food that we can imagine ways of helping people do that more efficiently. And thinking about packaging is one way of doing it. One thing I think a lot about um, is whether we could have more food that's available, actually I have the opposite thought of you, Hikaru, in smaller quantities so that people could buy the amounts they actually need or that their families would eat or that they know they could finish before it went bad and do that more frequently. Um, that actually used to be the way that a lot of food was sold. Um, by neighborhood peddlers and small stores and people bought in very small quantities every day. So that, that is possible. Um, and it, but I also think it's sort of what we're all saying, which is that solving food waste really requires thinking about um, structures and large solutions as well as bottom-up solutions, what things people can do in their homes that they think about, that they would like to be able to do, and how can we help people do that. Mine that, that will get turned on. Tracy, so I was surprised, so, sort of surprised to hear you say that if we, if we buy smaller things so we can go and get food that we're about to um, eat that day. Um, and I say surprised because one of the things that is, I have seen a lot in the sustainability realm is people saying, oh, well, we just need to spend more time with our food. We need to go back to where grandma cooked all day long and have this amazing food and we have this relationship with food and it um, irks me to no end because it's like I don't have that time, but I also don't have that time to go shopping every day. So I'm just curious, kind of, you can pull that apart a little more for us because I know we've had this conversation. So I think um, the whole idea that we should go back to what our grandmothers did, or this, um, I, you know, people in the history biz call this the devolution narrative, right? This idea that we've, we've gotten worse. That recurs in historically. So women, so the, the article that I started with in 1914 was saying to women, your grandmothers didn't use too much fuel. Why are you using too much fuel? And um, in the 1830s, Lydia Maria Child said, our forefathers didn't waste time or effort or food. Why are we wasting time and effort and food? So that kind of trope, this idea that, that we should, if we just redid something in the past, um, is itself really old. Our grandmothers, who were supposed to be like, were being told that they were doing something wrong. Um, the other um, response I have to that idea is, wh who's the we, right? I mean, whose grandmothers are we talking about? No, really, like, I don't eat the way my grandmother ate, and that's because my family looks really different than my grandmother's family, and my resources are really different from hers. Um, and I am lucky enough to live basically in the same region my grandmother lived in. Many people don't. They migrate. So, so while I appreciate the idea that there are things we can learn from the past, and I'd agree with that, I don't think that this, I think we need to problematize the idea that if we just did things the way women in particular did them hundreds of years ago, we'd be all right. Hi, hey, Carla. I'm curious, um, in energy, we talk about the rebound effect. We become more energy efficient, and then we end up using more energy. And I'm just curious if you've seen, either in your own work or in, in some of the peer studies that you um, know of, if we know we're composting, do we waste more food? The rebound effect, uh, yes, we actually found it in our own study, and there are at least one other study that have found it. So yeah, it's, it's in both settings, whether it's in households that are told that um, 
uh, now you have organic waste recycling, so your waste will be recycled, and they just feel guilt less, less, less feels less guilt, and, and so they end up um, they end up putting more in, in, into waste, and it's been also shown in um, a dining service setting as well. It, it could have been the university cafeteria, I can't remember, but. Well, have you noticed, does that, there it goes. Well, have you noticed as you've recovered your, at least a couple of years recovering at the university, have you seen a change in the total food um, that you've been able to recover? Um, we have actually seen an increase at the end of the year recoveries. We don't uh, at the moment have a reason as to why. That could be um, greater awareness and greater participation from um, the dining halls because earlier when we first started, this was about a year and a half ago when we first started doing end of the year food recoveries, maybe two years ago at this point, um, a lot of times the kitchen managers wouldn't be aware that we'd be trying to recover the food. Um, but now we get there and they have it all ready and stuff. And so um, I guess it's hard to determine whether that's an increase in awareness or if the thought of being able to donate more food allows them to think that they can buy more and um, just, I guess, waste more in general too. Yeah. Oh, it's gonna sound, sorry. Um, so can we solve hunger by solving food waste? I, it's, it's a definite no from my perspective. Uh, it's never worked well when a policy that's designed to address one thing was ever really done a good job, um, like solving that particular one that it was trying to address, but also trying to address something else that's associated with it. So um, I, I would advocate more for separate, you know, one, food, re food waste reduction, but then also a separate uh, policy initiatives f to address the hunger issue. Well, do you, uh, do you want to chime in? I mean, this is what FRN does. Um, I agree with that. Uh, I think if we are able to uh, redirect a lot of food, it'd be a really good thing. But again, it goes back to the buy-in and incentives. And like we as a group struggle to have volunteership. And at Loaves and Fishes, we see the same thing. They don't have enough manpower. Um, they don't have enough resources pretty much to get to the food, the food that is wasted to the people that need it. Um, so I think that solving food waste would definitely improve that a lot, but just the structures would need to change massively before we can actually say like, this is solved and by association this is also solved. Sorry, everybody, but such is life in a livestock building. I have a question for you unless you want to make a comment about this, Tracy. Uh, I was going to say really quickly, um, I think we need to think about who the we is, who is solving food waste, right? So who's, who are we solving it for, and who's the we involved in thinking about the solution? Wow. Now I have to think about that before my next question, but but that, no, that's okay because I I I heard you you know speaking about food waste now and this talk of sustainability kind of driving it, and I think back to the '80s to age myself when I was a child, and it was don't waste food because there's a hunger problem. Of course, that hunger problem was elsewhere that we often talked about, and I challenged my parents, what are you going to do? Like put this together and ship it off somewhere, um, which of course not. But but I. Did that sort of mantra kind of show an ev evolution of understanding hunger in a way? I mean, how has the, the storyline of hunger and food waste kind of played out? Sorry. <laughs> no. No. Um, so I will say that my knowledge of this comes from my own life, not from <laughs> being a historian, but I have really painful memories of singing Feed the World along with other people. I can tell who's as old as me. Um, um, I think that that moment, I think it did mark a shift in thinking about, not so much about food waste as about hunger as a broad social and political problem in that it was um, a massive effort by um, artists to get involved with um, anti-hunger efforts. And that kind of effort on that scale was pretty new, that, that artists and creative folks would get involved in hunger in that way. Um, 
But there is a, a long history to their to these sort of surges of interest around hunger, especially in Africa and in Asia, in the United States. So, you know, we were told in the 80s, don't waste food, and um, young kids were told in the 1940s after World War II, don't waste food, there are starving children in Europe. Um, people were told, I'm just uh, gonna teach my students about how people were told in the 1880s, um, don't waste food, there's starving children in India when there was a big famine in India. So there are these, so we have almost a preset response to famine and starvation and hunger um, that I think speaks to people's good intentions and also to the difficulty of actually addressing hunger in its local context, as it varies. Go ahead, Will, and then we're gonna go to Q and A's, so start thinking. This is a question for you, Tracy. Um, seeing as it has been a pattern every 30, 40 years, um, has there been any development or like, um, I guess a greater stance, or not stance, um, just greater action each year? Or is it about the same where it just is like all for naught, we're telling kids don't eat, there's starving kids in Africa, and it's the same thing? Yeah, I would never say that, that attempts to end hunger are for naught. I oh, think... No, <laughs> Sorry, I meant telling our kids is all for not, just like, oh. yeah, not the, not, don't, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it teaches kids that they should think about people in other places and poverty and inequity, and I think that's, that's for the good. I don't think that's for not. Um, but there's been a lot of work on hunger and the ways that it is about political instability and, and the collapse of local institutions, as well as um, things like environmental change and climate destruction. And, but solving, sometimes it seems much more difficult to solve the collapse of political institutions or local inequities than to send food. So I think that that suggests not that we, not that, and things have changed a lot over time. Um, there's whole infrastructures now around food insecurity and hunger that weren't there even 15 years ago. So that's changed a ton. Um, and I think, I hope that many people are starting to think creatively about how hunger is embedded in local contexts and how it needs to be addressed differently in different places and in different contexts. So we'll have questions from the audience and we have people with microphones that will bring them to you. I'm going to try without microphones. No, you need to for the online audience. I'm sorry. Testing. I have two questions, if I may. Uh, when was the zenith in the U.S., when was the zenith of food conservation? Was it World War II with Victory Gardens and a constraint, if you will, a worldwide constraint of uh, save your food for your troops and all that sort of stuff? That's question number one. Uh, question number two is a little more involved. Um, growing up on a farm as I did, with uh, measures of bushel per acre ending up in the market as dollars per whatever your unit is, uh, there's a big gap between the long tail of what does that mean in terms of production, choice of commodities, and eventually what's on the table and how industry has aligned itself. Is there a better measure than dollar per whatever that is coming into the lingua uh, the, the language of what it means to make food choices. Because what I see today is we're way out of balance, for example, in corn and soybeans. Way out of balance in terms of how it's used and where it's going and why it's the mainstay in our uh, agricultural economy. So, two questions there. Tracy, do you want the first one? The zine? Sorry. The second. Um, no, 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 it's good. Um, <laughs> so, that is the kind of, an of question that there's no answer to because it's not like there were surveys being taken in the 1790s asking people about their food use. Um, but we, I, and it's also the kind of question that gets to how hard it is to talk about food waste as a discrete thing um, because, you know, in a time period in which people were more isolated from each other and more, never fully self-sufficient. I want to be really clear, they were not. Um, there was, but more 
um, reliant on local networks, there was probably less waste. I would say there was also far more inequity, right? Far more dispossession and far less equitable distribution of food and resources. And there was less waste. Um, but I, besides that annoying historian answer, um, in terms of World War II, what's really interesting, yes, there were, and World War I, I would say, really large-scale conservation efforts that really did make a difference in terms of people's use. And one reason that they, there were two reasons they worked. One, there were large public drives and a real infrastructure around conservation, so that there were paper drives and metal drives and, and ways that people could easily use those um, use those things that they might have otherwise thrown out. And that was um, one reason that they succeeded. So there was a sense of public purpose, and there was a lot of public culture and infrastructure around it. Yeah. Um, it's fair. I think that. Um, if I may reinterpret the question slightly. <laughs> um, I, I heard the second. I actually heard two pieces um, from it. One, maybe I heard because I know of a paper Hikaru wrote that um, was really fascinating about the, the value of food waste and how the value along the supply chain, we use the end value to like sum up. And so we actually overvalue the actual waste. And, and so if you want to touch on that, I, I think that was at least mind blowing for me. Um, and then the second piece I think is bigger, this larger question of we have this ag system that produces corn and soy, but we don't eat corn and soy. <laughs> but we do. And neither does livestock. But that's not true, they do eat it. They, they do, they could eat it. They could. And the reason why they have livestock that way is more calorie per acre, but it also means they have to take all sorts of things to smooth their stomachs so they can actually eat it. Yeah. So, So I, I will take this, and then I'll hand you to talk about the, the, the um, first part. Um, I will respond by saying it is insanely mechanized. So I um, have been spending the last five years researching our animal ag industry, and this notion that we have an animal eating something on some lovely field is totally bogus. Like, this is mechanized to the, it's like a machine. I mean, it's biology, and the biologist to me is like, oh, it's a cow, but the truth of the matter is, is it's so engineered and so, like, focused exactly on what nutrients when that it, that that is what's driving corn and soy. Um, and, and you get amazing results from it in terms of productivity of the size of these animals, but there are externalities, there are costs to that system, so. Um, I think you've highlighted a great another second Monday's topic that we can have. <laughs> Do you want to talk at all about that paper with um, on the price of pricing food waste? Um, no, I, well, <laughs> I, I, I think you you did a great job of of talking about it. I mean, the the ba basic premise is that you know when, again in 2015 when we when I started looking at this, there were a, a lot and, and there still exists a lot of alarming statistics about food waste, but um, when you think about you know, the sausage making of where those, those large alarming statistics come from, you, 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 have to, you, know, you really have to question like, what are they actually measuring? Um, and and uh, it, it's great to get people's attention, but at the same time, it, if it's, if it's a, a metric that we can't really uh, track in order to, to see progress or, or to make realistic policy goals, then, then I think it's, it's not very useful. Okay. I have got these microphones, I tell you. I've got two questions, so I'll keep it really quick for you. Um, the first one is, can you talk a little bit about the role of expiration labels? I've read a number of stories saying that our labels are just pretty much junk, and that's causing a lot of un unnecessary food waste. So talk a little bit about labels, please. And then the second thing is, um, what would really change behavior? We heard a few of you say that guilt doesn't do it. We've all heard throughout our lives, don't throw out food because of the starving children and fill in the blank. So does it get down to the economics of it? Do we need to let people know how much they're losing in terms of dollars? 
or potentially charge even more for food? So it's, is there an economic component or what does really change that behavior? If you end a question with the economics, then I guess I have to take it. <laughs> um, so, so about labels. Uh, so yes, the labels do matter, but like again, a, another different study that, that I've done with a student, um, the amount of food waste is, uh, yes, it, it varies by the types of, you know, uh, expiration date labels that are being used and, and, and being, you know, discussed in, in, in con Congress and, and whatnot, um, has a, it has a marginal effect, like that's, that's, that, that would be different, but, but what's more uh, salient and, and just uh, overrides all those kind of effects are the food appearance. So if, 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 if the food is perfectly edible, but it's, it's cosmetically deteriorating, that affects people's amount to, to discard a lot more than how, how the, the food date is, is being presented. How to solve this? I can't guilt them. Oh, oh, oh the, the, the economics of, of, of encouraging people to change uh, behavior. I don't know, that's, that's really hard. Uh, Partly, I'm, I'm thinking about you know all these things that we're we're not supposed to do, like you know, um, like chew or smoke, chew tobacco or, or smoke, and, and people still pay to harm themselves. So, it's it's not it's not a, a, a straight answer. I, I don't know. I don't think economics alone would 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 uh, um, be an answer by any means. But, but I also feel like there's a lot of cognitive limit on how you can really induce people to think differently to change their behavior. And that's why I'm kind of to a point where, you know, technology, I mean, I think there are technological progresses that can be made so that in a way we don't rely on our individual behavioral change in order to bring about the big change. I'm in, no pressure. Um, going back to that, I do think uh, making it more of a learned behavior uh, could be beneficial because like what we were talking about with the war, war efforts, that was a lot of, um, I don't know if you'd necessarily pr say propaganda, but um, just outspoken by the government uh, saying why we need to res reserve food and stuff. And we did see a, a large conservation of food during those times. Um, so maybe making it more of a learned behavior um, through early childhood education or um, yeah, just making it more aware. And we have talked about awareness before, but maybe if we'd be able to incorporate it at a younger age or something like that. Correct. I have one question. Uh, <laughs> why fish and loaves and not uh, donating to the pantry here on campus? The food that we get is not really available for nutritious you. Most of it is dried goods and canned goods. Um, there is produce, but the produce we usually get comes in like chopped and ready form. Like uh, we get a lot of stuff from Subway and so it'd be difficult to have like slices of cheese for students to come and grab. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, hey, like I wouldn't mind that, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and th it is a lot easier for them to dis distribute it. Um, they make sandwiches. I think they make like thousand, a couple thousand of sandwiches when they like have their sandwich making days. And so like the stuff that we send them is like pretty beneficial to that because um, then they can make sandwiches with it. But um, yeah, that's mainly why, yeah. So as a food scientist, there are two things that concern me about um, repurposing food that has already reached um, end users, safety and quality. And so when you were thinking about lots of people have already handled food, they've gotten it ready to eat, people are done with that, and then you're trying to bring that back to somebody else. What has your experience been in the potential lawsuits that are waiting to happen about moving norovirus from campus to food pantries and things like that? And then the concept of repurposing food that might not meet um, store quality but still has nutritional value. The concern that we see around that is if, if the market has already deemed food less than quality for market, how do you handle the, I'm looking for the right word, the perception that you're giving people food that has been 
seen less than valuable for the rest, and that's because they can't afford to buy food that looks better. So what has your experience been around that? Um, in terms of food safety, the Food Recovery Network uh, National Organization has like a long list of things to like say about it, and um, hourly, no more than I think three hours for food that has been heated um, or less than that. Uh, and so we just follow those requirements. Um, and those are pretty strict if we if food has been sitting out for too long and often most all the food we can collect has not even been put out It's stuff that was saved towards the end of the day um, That was going to be put out, but it never came to use um, And so most all the food we collect is has never seen like the light of day It stayed in the fridge the whole time and it wanted to be used, but it wasn't um, And so most of that I'd say food safety we've we usually steer clear of things that have been sitting out for a while. If they say, like, this was out at a buffet, we can't really accept it. Um, and then, what was the other part? The perspective or perception of uh, lower quality food being used? Yes, but can I, before we get into that, I want to say a few things about um, the food safety. So first off, the Good Samaritan Act protects you. If you want to donate food, if you, let's, well, more if you want to hire someone, let's say a caterer, and then you want that caterer to donate the extra food. Um, we do have laws to protect that in good faith, you're, you're trying to do the right thing. Um, and so we actually don't want people thinking that they shouldn't do it um, from, that, from the food safety perspective. Um, although there are things very mindful that people need to be aware of and, and the Food Recovery Network and other organizations that recover food, um, of course, educate their employees on it. Um, and I also wanted to point out that this is not just an issue when we send it to humans. Um, one of the more recent swine viruses that they're dealing with, actually they saw gets transmitted by food waste um, as well. And so this, as we go across the pyramid, um, has implications on other areas. But the second piece, both of you. So I'll just say really quickly that what I love about that question is that it points to how the idea of waste is constructed differently by different people. So what might look like waste you look at and see as food that's inedible or, or food that is a mark of, of inequity, right? That people are forced to eat because they have no other choice. And that's why I think conceptualizing the problem in terms of waste is, you know, it's limited in some ways, right? Be I don't know what it is. I don't know that I have a great solution, but, um, but it really speaks to how difficult it is to, to use that language to talk about this. Uh, in, my, in one of my undergrad classes, I, I challenged the students to come up with, uh, because of that perception about waste and like reused food being like having a, some sort of negative connotation, like how would you, you know, it's like a marketing, like what, what would you call uh, a food or a banquet that's, that's made from reused, upcycled food, how, however you want to call it. And I think the best one that I've, I've uh, heard so far is like well-traveled food. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question, I'm curious as to why the U of M in particular with your food recovery program has an unlimited all you can eat. That to me says waste, big time. Um, this has actually been a talk, uh, I believe last year, um, what I'm trying to say, student government was looking to change the uh, food provider, uh, currently it's Aramark. Um, and that was one of the discussions of, as well as whether or not we should have um, single plate or buffet. And when it comes down to it, I think it was found to be around the same amount of food waste. It's hard to tell. Buff buffet style does inherently, can, uh, I guess you could say, perpetuate the idea of waste because you have a huge pot of food. But at the same time, single plate is nearly the same thing because you're, you're not just ordering it and it, it requires more time, I guess. Um, a lot of times they'll just put out a plate of food and, um, yeah, it, it, it's hard to... to well, or, or couldn't there be a way to, um, because I, I think portion control is important too and we haven't really touched on that at all, um, being Americans, um, bigging, biggie sizing everything and all of that, but um, that's another topic. But I guess I think you can have choices for people to come and have their own portion, but 
I'm, I'm concerned about the mass quantity of making it, of, you know what I mean? Having the huge pot, uh, more of a, um, a controlled environment, I guess, where, where you kind of have your backups, if you will. I just wondered if that was at all thought of. Um, I, I believe it has been, but I, I do think uh, difficulties again come through with logistics, um, especially with what we've talked about, like uh, just how food is brought to the table. Um, that is going to require a lot more labor in, rather than buffet style. Um, so I think, yeah, usually just logistics and cost is, have been big barriers when it comes to portion control. Um, disclosure, I'm on the national board for the Food Recovery Network, <laughs> um, <laughs> as is some people from some of these food organizations. And actually, one of the things that we don't know is how much food potential there is to be recovered. So there's new software, back to some of this technology out, that some of these big companies are using called Lean Path to try and understand how much food is wasted or could be recovered or could be used. Um, and so I think that's starting to bleed into this system. But right now, we actually have all this data about how much food has been recovered with no understanding of how much there could have been recovered. And that's pretty important. Um, and with this, we're at our last question. I'm sorry, but we are all going to stay here, I think, afterward for a few minutes at the very least. Um, so you can come up and talk. But um, I'm going to take back the questions and, and ask the last one. Um, I'm curious if, if you could leave this audience with one thing, either as a solution or one thing to remember as they get bombarded with food waste messages, which we know we're going to, what would you want that one thing to be? Okay, why they think, I'll tell you mine. Um, one of the best things I ever heard I felt from, um, in terms of advice to deal with food waste was grow your own food, because then you understand the water, the land, the fertilizer, which leads to GHGs, and we can talk about that also, you know, like the inputs that go into that. And so while, while I'm not advocating that we can grow our own food to serve our own tables and, and equal that in any way, I do think the fact that I grew this green bean and I understand how hard it was after the rabbits ate it, that it gives me a better appreciation um, for that. Um, so that's a piece that I'll leave you with. So I guess I would say that thinking that if there was one message I would want to leave people with, it's that your individual approach to food waste should be part of a larger politics around sustainability and environmental well-being. It's not the end-all, be-all of the work that you do around this, and it's not, it's not the point at which things succeed or fail. So think big. Well, that's a hard one to follow. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I, I think, um, yes, there, there's just a limit to how we can change our behavior. And, and, and I go back to how Tracy kind of started out at the very beginning that what we do really is affected by the constraints that we have and in our, 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 that which includes the lifestyle and, and the, the era that w in which we live in. And so, um, I really want to challenge the chemical engineers out there to come up with a plastic alternative that would that you know could be used in in, in food packaging so that um, there's just a lot more that could be uh, recycled from from organic waste and I think that goes far far away in terms of uh, minimizing or reducing landfill amount um, kind of going off of yours Jennifer of just um being aware of what goes into it, just um, as a volunteer organization, I guess, get involved, understand more why food waste is an issue and why people are hungry. Doing this group has really just opened my eyes to a lot of that. Um, going to a football game and realizing that there's 900 pounds plus of food being going to waste every single football game, and that's not everything because we can't take everything because we don't have that much capacity. Um, but yeah, just get involved and start to understand where food is being wasted and just try to think about it more yourself, I guess. And if you want to get involved, go talk to Will about joining FRN. <laughs> Thank you very much.